Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldman, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldman. Okay, it's good to see everybody in again this afternoon, and uh, my, it's uh, just always a pleasure, especially when we skip the taping, and it's been a couple months since we've seen everybody here in the studio. But uh, we're glad to be back and glad to have everybody here with us. Again, for those of you joining us on television, uh, we trust that there's every day new listeners coming in and we have to make a short explanation that we're not denominational, we're not underwritten by anybody, we're just a simple Bible teaching class, we're independent, and uh, we answer only to the Lord Himself, but on the other hand, we need the prayers and the support of everybody involved, and so we do thank you for your letters, your prayers, and your financial support. And uh, it's uh, so thrilling and encouraging as we read our mail that uh, especially men, in fact, we had a gentleman stop by yesterday who was just traveling through this part of the world. And he'd been listening for seven, eight years, had never made contact with us, but he said, Les, he said, your program has changed my life. Well, that is so typical of so many men that uh, we realize the Lord is reaching out to. So all right, we're going to just jump right in where we left off after our last program taping. And we're going to continue this afternoon with the covenants that God has made predominantly between Himself and the nation of Israel. And that's why we refer to Israel over and over as His covenant people. Now, you know, the vast majority of the world don't have a clue. In fact, in yesterday's paper or one of the news magazines I read, one of the Arab leaders of the Middle East said, where in the world do these Jews get the idea that they're the chosen people? Well, this book is full of it. This book is full of it. And we can stand on the authority of this book because it's the only proven Word of God on the planet. There may be tons and tons of religious writings and books, but they are not the inspired Word of God which has proved itself by fulfilled <coughs> prophecy. Anytime someone asks you, well, why are you so adamant that you can trust the Bible as the only true Word of God? Fulfilled prophecy. And I've said that on the program over and over. There is no other book on earth that could foretell things 100 years in advance, a 1,000 years in advance, and yet now what we see happening today, literally several thousand years in advance, and yet here it's all falling in place. In fact, I had a phone call just yesterday. What are some of the time, signs of the times that we're near the end? Well, that's not hard for those of us who know our Bible. The number one sign of the times is Israel back in the land. And those of us that have just come back from over there, it is unbelievable, unbelievable what they have done again, even in just the last five years. It's it, it just mind-boggling. Why? Because God is in it. They don't think so. You ask the average Israeli, uh, is God doing all this? No, 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 we're doing it ourselves, but we know better. And so this book that has proven itself by fulfilled prophecy is full of the covenant promises that God has made with His chosen people, the nation of Israel. All right, now the last tape, we went through some of the earlier covenants, even before Israel became a nation, and that goes back, of course, to creation. The covenant that God made with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when everything was still perfect, the curse hadn't fallen, sin hadn't shown up, and uh, it was a covenant promise. And then, of course, the next one was a covenant that God <coughs> made with Adam, as to how God would deal with Adam outside the garden under the curse. And uh, then we kept moving on to the Noahic covenant where God made a promise to Noah and the families that never again would he destroy the planet with water. And so he set the rainbow in the clouds as an indication of that covenant. And then we came to the next one, if I remember correctly, was the Mosaic covenant. Is that right? Huh? Abrahamic is in there. Yeah, I'm going to leave that later. Next comes the call of Abraham. About halfway between Adam and Christ's first advent, about 2000 B.C. So you see, actually, your covenants are another way of a timeline. They just keep coming up through Old Testament time. All right, we're going to come back and spend more time on the Abrahamic covenant, 
But nevertheless, that was the onset then of the nation of Israel and all the covenant promises that would follow in the steps of the Abrahamic covenant. Now then, the next one, after Abraham has established the nation of Israel, and Israel is going to become a special set-aside vehicle through which God can work amongst all the nations of the world, we come to the next covenant, which was law. And uh, we covered the three aspects of Israel's law, which was the moral law, the Ten Commandments, and then we covered the ecclesiastical, or the ritual, or the temple worship part of the law, and then we spent the last few moments, if I remember correctly, on the civil law, how to get along with your neighbor and how to settle problems between individuals or between communities. And those three parts then comprise what we refer to in Scripture as the Mosaic Law. All right, now then that brings us up to the next great covenant promise, and that has to do with the promised land. And... Uh, We've referred to the title of it as the Palestinian Covenant. Now I know that in the last taping up front I explained it, but I'm going to repeat it again. That whenever we use the term Palestine, it does not refer to the Promised Land per se. Palestine is just a geographical area there off to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. It can go all the way out to the Persian Gulf, really. But uh, it is always referred to in Scripture as Palestine, coming from the term Philistines. But within the geographical area of Palestine, we have the Promised Land, the nation of Israel. And for most of us who know our Old Testament, Israel only went a little ways east of the Jordan River for the three tribes that Moses gave permission to stay providing they sent their young men in with the rest of the tribes to fight for the uh, independence of the land of the Canaanites. All right, so now we're going to take a look then of all the promises that are associated with this land promise given to the offspring of Abraham. They now have the law in place, they have the tabernacle, and they're ready to move on up into the promised land. Now, in order to verify then that Israel's taking over of the land of Canaan was by God's design. It wasn't greed on the Israelis' part. It wasn't greed on Moses' part. But God had mandated that that strip of real estate between the Mediterranean and especially the Jordan River was the promised land, and which will, of course, later, when Christ sets up the kingdom, will go all the way out to the Euphrates River. All right, now if you'll come in with me then, in Deuteronomy 29, we have the first mention of this covenant promise of a piece of real estate, or what we call the Palestinian Covenant. Chapter 29, verse 1. Now these are the words of the covenant. See, there's the word. Now maybe I should stop and define a covenant again. A covenant in Scripture is that which originated in God, even though it's on behalf, of, in this case, of the nation of Israel. <laughs> Yet it stops with God. In other words, even though Israel may break these covenant promises, God does not break the covenant Himself. And we're going to see that, especially when we get to the New Covenant, when they refer to the Old Covenant, which Israel broke, but God didn't. And so always remember that these covenant promises are unbreakable until God decides to end it of His own volition. Okay, so these are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab. This covenant is beside the covenant which He made with them in Horeb. Now, what's He talking about in Horeb? Well, that's the covenant of law that was given back at Mount Sinai. So this is a second covenant involving the children of Israel. The first, He gave them the law, as we've already explained, the moral law, the ecclesiastical, the civil law. But now he's giving them yet another covenant because after all, you cannot have a group of people unless they have a homeland. Otherwise, it's just anarchy and they're just nomads. So they're going to have to have a homeland. And so God, by design now, has set the stage for Israel to go in and take over the land of Canaan They've been working and promoting it and getting it ready for Israel for 430 years, remember. And now this becomes then 
the covenant of the land that God is going to promise to Israel. All right, now then verse 2. So Moses called unto all Israel, and he said unto them, You have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, unto Pharaoh and all his servants, and unto all his land, the great temptations or testings which thy eyes have seen, the signs and the great miracles. See? All right, now then come down to verse 7. And when you came unto this place, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan, came out against us unto battle, and we smote them. They defeated them. Verse 8, we took their land and gave it for an inheritance to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and the half-tribe Manasseh. Now, those are the three tribes that stayed then on the east side of the Jordan River. Now, you know, I always like to use geography and history to make these things plain. Remember that when Moses left Sinai, he took them up to the south side of the land of Canaan, Kadesh Barnea, and told them to go in and take the land. Well, I trust you all know by now what happened. In unbelief, they rejected. They said, we can't do it. So they came back out into the wilderness for 40 years until that generation died off. Now then, Moses brings them around on the east side of the Dead Sea, which is on the east side of Jordan River, and they're going to come in from the east into the land of Canaan. All right, now as they are approaching the Jordan River from the east and they see the land of Canaan out in front of them, in fact, on a clear day, you can be up there on Mount Nebo where Moses died, and on a clear day, you can see clear across to the Mediterranean Sea. Now, those of you that were just with us in Israel, it's amazing how much of the land you can see from a high spot. We were on one of the promenades above the city of Nazareth the other day, and it was a beautiful day, wasn't it? My, the pictures of that up there are just unbelievable. But you can stand up there just in front of Nazareth, and you can look almost to the Sea of Galilee, because the nation of Israel is so small, see? All right, so now here again, these three tribes are going to stay on the east side of Jordan. Now I've got to make a point. When I'm constantly referring to the fact that Jesus never had anything to do in ministering to Gentiles in his earthly ministry, the one that people like to throw up, well, what about the Gadarenes, where he sent the, the demons, you remember, out of the swine and, and into the sea? Well, the Gadarenes, you see, were generations removed from what tribe? Gad, see? So, no, he wasn't dealing with Gentiles. He was still dealing with the offspring of these three tribes who had stayed on the east side of the Jordan River. Easy to understand if you know what the book said. Okay, so now then, after giving permission for those three tribes to stay east of the Jordan, verse 9, keep therefore the words of this, what again? Covenant. This agreement that God is going to give the nation of Israel the homeland for them to enjoy as their own land. All right, now then, verse 12. That thou shouldst enter into covenant with the Lord thy God, and into his oath, which the Lord thy God maketh with thee this day, that he may establish thee today for a people unto himself, that he may be unto thee a God, as he has said unto thee, and he has sworn to thy fathers, that is, to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, now right there again, I've got to remind you of that verse that we use over and over in the book of Romans. Romans 15, verse 8. Many of you should be able to start quoting it from memory. And what does it say? That Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, the nation of Israel, for the truth of God, but for what purpose? to confirm or to fulfill the promises made to the fathers. That's what Paul writes. All right, who were the fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what were the promises? That God himself would take the nation into their own promised land, and after a period of time, they didn't know how long, but after a period of time, he would come in the person of God the Son, the Messiah of Israel, and rule and reign from Jerusalem. Now this is all part and parcel of getting Israel ready for the coming of their Messiah. 
All right, now then I think we can come all the way down to chapter 30, and now we're going to leap the centuries, almost the millennia, and now we're going to see a prophetic promise concerning the children of Israel. They're going to be uprooted out of this promised land at least twice. The first time was when Nebuchadnezzar came from Babylon and overran the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the city and the temple, burned it to the ground, and took the nation of Israel captive. Well, 70 years later, a small remnant came back, of course, and then the second time it happened, almost deja vu all over again, only now it's the Romans, and in 70 AD, Rome besieged the city of Jerusalem, Rome crashed the gates, and Rome destroyed the temple, and Rome uprooted the Jew out of their city and out of their land by God's decree. All right, now here we pick it up then in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Now remember, this is Moses writing 1,500 years before Christ, or 3,500 years before where we are today, and we're seeing the fulfillment of this, pro of this promise and prophecy right now today. All right, verse 1 of Deuteronomy 30. And it shall come to pass. Now, when God says it's going to happen, you can just bank on it. And all these things are come upon thee, blessings and curses, which I have set before thee. And thou, that is, the nation of Israel, thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations. Now, watch what that says. That means every nation on the planet will have Jews within it because they've been uprooted out of the land and God has providentially scattered them into every nation under heaven. Now, of course, when Moses writes, it's prophecy. But here you and I are now sitting in the daytime looking at these fulfilled promises that after being scattered, they are now brought back into their promised land. Verse 2, after being scattered, thou shalt return, that is, to their homeland. And thou shalt obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day, thou and thy children, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. All right, now verse 3. When they would come back from this final dispersion, that then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity, have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations. Now, isn't it hard to comprehend why the world in general can't understand that? They won't read it. And don't just blame the unbelieving world. Most church people won't. They refuse to believe these things. They don't even want to read it. But there it is in plain English. I can't put it any other way. That after they've been dispersed into every nation under heaven, God is going to providentially bring them back into their homeland as we see even today. All right, verse 4. I think this is even interesting. In case a Jew is out in outer space with a rocket or whatever, or if he's on a space station, if any of thine be driven out unto the outmost force of heaven, from thence will the Lord thy God gather thee, and from thence he will fetch thee. Now verse 5. Now I want you to be constantly aware of this one word, land over and over and over, God is talking about this covenant by which Israel will have her homeland. All right? And the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possessed. That is, back under the time of Joshua especially, and uh, then going on through the times of the judges. All right? And so the Lord thy God will gather thee, and he will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possess. He will do to thee good and multiply thee above thy fathers. Now verse 6, we're going to come back to this when we deal with the new covenant. I don't know if we'll get that far today or not. I hope to. But when he deals with Israel under the new covenant, then verse 6 kicks in. Not until. In other words, even tonight, you ask the average Jew anywhere in the world, anything pertaining to these promises, and he's totally ignorant of them. 
They just do not have a comprehension that God is providentially taking care of them. He's helping them overcome all the obstacles because it's prophecy. It has to happen. All right, so the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land. Well, we're not going to finish everything I wanted on this one, but I'm going to jump up for sake of time now all the way to Ezekiel, which talks more about some of these promises than any of the other major books of prophecy. But I'm going to bring you to Ezekiel. I think I'm going to want 34. Ezekiel 34. Let's start at verse 11, honey. Ezekiel 34, verse 11. Now, don't forget what we've just covered, that God, by covenant design, has set aside that piece of real estate between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River and a little beyond for his chosen people. And it's by his sovereign design. No United Nations can overrule it. No White House decree can overrule it. Congress can't overrule it. This is the sovereign God. All right, now then, Ezekiel 34, starting verse 11, For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. Now, I've made the statement, and I've been surprised that I didn't get flack. Who are the sheep of Scripture? Israel, the Jew. The Jew is the sheep of Scripture. And their Messiah, God the Son, is their shepherd. Now, you see, Paul never refers to you and I as Gentile members of the body of Christ as sheep. And he doesn't refer to Christ as our shepherd. Now, he does use it in one place in one of his letters, but not that he's the shepherd of the body of Christ, but he's the chief shepherd of all creation. And so always make that distinction. The sheep of Scripture are the nation of Israel. All right, come back to our text then. So verse 12, As a shepherd seeketh out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, as Israel was in the dispersions, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and the dark day. Now verse 13. Now listen, this is the promises of God. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land. Now do you see why some of us get upset when the Israeli government, probably under the pressure of our American government, want to give back land to the Arabs? That flies in the face of God's promises. They have no right to give one square foot to anybody but the nation of Israel. It's covenanted. It's theirs by God's design. All right, he will bring them into their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel. Now it's interesting. You know, we promoted a little paperback several months or maybe a couple years ago with the title of which, The Mountains of Israel. Now, you know, all the mountains of Israel, as we see them delineated in the Old Testament, are presently under Arab control. They're in the West Bank. And do you think God's going to rest until that's been corrected? No way. And so as we sometimes wonder what in the world is the future, we can rest assured that one day God's going to set everything straight according to his promises. All right, another verse or two here. And uh, the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country, I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. Now he's talking about the people, not the sheep. And even in these mountainous areas of Israel, it's going to be lush and green and productive. Now, you know, this is the one thing I think we all noticed, didn't we, Charlie? Israel has had an abundance of rain and snow all winter. The Sea of Galilee was full once again. The last time Iris and I were over there, it was almost pitiful. The shoreline was way, way out, and they had reached what they called the red line, where they could no longer take water from it. 
and uh, now this time it was full to the brim and the countryside was just beautiful. Everything was green and the flowering trees were in bloom and we could just genuinely see how it is definitely like a rose blooming in the desert today. All right, so now you can get a good picture of this. They aren't even close yet. This is all going to take place after Christ returns and sets up the kingdom, see? But we're already seeing the beginnings of it. All right, verse 14 again, I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold, and in a fat pasture they shall feed upon the mountains of Israel. Now that's symbolic language, of course, but how the nation is going to enjoy all the blessings of Jehovah. See? All right, and then verse 16. I will seek that which was, what? Lost. Oh, the nation of Israel tonight, for the most part, is lost in unbelief. They don't even have a comprehension that everything that they're able to do is by God's design. It's really sad. And yet we who know Scripture know better. We know that God is in sovereign control of everything that's taking place over there. All right, read verse 16, then our time's going to be gone. I will bring again that which was driven away. I will bind up that which was broken. I will strengthen that which was sick. And I will destroy the fat and the strong, that is, their enemies. And I will feed them with judgment, and I've always defined that word judgment in Scripture as a benevolent government. Whenever we speak of judgment, like here, it speaks of a benevolent government that indeed is operating for only one purpose, and that is the good of the people that are under it. And then verse 17, I guess it will be time to close. And as for you, O my flock, my nation of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between rams and he goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures. And verse 19 again, And as ye, for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet, they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Thus saith the Lord, God will judge Thus saith the Lord, God unto them, Behold, I and I will judge between the fat and the lean. Now all he's saying there is that when Israel comes into the place of blessing, all of those who have opposed her will come under the wrath and the judgment of Thank the sovereign God. Thank you for God. watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Veldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.